organizing for Africa, for the African, to support Africa uh, in dealing with the global catastrophic biological risk. So this program, in brief, was um, inspired by the challenges that we uh, uh, exhibited during COVID-19 pandemics. Uh, we all know that COVID-19 came at a time when all the member states or all the countries were not prepared. I mean, if you can see, even the superpower US was getting a lot of challenge in handling uh, COVID-19. So it was uh, really very challenging. Uh, that's why as seen by Africa, uh, we sat down and we said, uh, we need to do something for our continent. And uh, we came up with uh, a plan, and the plan became a project. So uh, we had to look for how we can implement. So I want to thank um, Open Philanthropy for supporting this program. Uh, this is just the first phase of the program. After this, we shall be heading to the second phase. And uh, we hope that you being the pioneers in this program, we shall continue to work with you. So this is the first uh, workshop that we are going to have. Um, the second workshop will uh, take place in uh, North Africa. The third will be in West Africa. And then the fourth will be in South Africa. So we hope to work with some of you th throughout these workshops, the series of high level uh, workshop that we are going to be having. So this is a very, a very specific and closed uh, workshop that we are running. As you have heard from the introduction, these are very key people uh, in their respective countries who are handling uh, issues around biosafety, biosecurity, and health. So uh, it was really uh, challenging to bring you here. Uh, because there are a lot of logistical uh, considerations and also trying to figure out your timing. So it was not easy, so we don't want to take it for granted. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, throughout uh, the three days of uh, the workshop, we expect you to give your maximum participation. And uh, this is uh, uh, not... Uh, like a lecture, but all of us are supposed to uh, get involved in the discussion so that we can come up with the best way we can uh, support our continent in dealing with GCBR. I, I don't have a lot to say because uh, we already have our facilitators here. I don't want to mention all the names, but I must say everyone here who has traveled from uh, different destinations, I'm so grateful for you uh, for considering our call and responding. Um, at this point of time, I want to uh, end my opening remarks and I wish all of you a successful training for the next three days that we are going to be here. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out to me for any further clarification on this project. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to take you back to the, the MC of uh, the program. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Geoffrey, for those remarks. The Next person to give us briefly, Harry Marx, the Chairperson Executive Committee, after whom we shall start off with the business that brought us all here. Ms. Sandra. 
Uh, thank you so much, the MC. Once again, a very good morning to you all who are here. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our dear uh, participants and uh, speakers who are online. We are very, very delighted to have you with us for this uh, particular workshop. Once again, uh, my name is uh, Martini Sandra, and I am the chairperson in Africa. On behalf of Sinbio Africa, I would like to welcome you to Uganda, the Pearl of Africa. I hope you're already enjoying the environment for those of us who have come from other places. And I really, really hope you'll have a great stay here. Um, Sinbio Africa is a forum of different uh, stakeholders. And these stakeholders are from all different fields that you could ever think about. And here we are talking about uh, people in academia, we are talking about the communities around us, we are talking about uh, students, we are talking about uh, policymakers, and any other stakeholder that you could think about. And this forum brings all of us together. And the aim of us coming together is to see that we champion synthetic biology across Africa. Uh, synthetic biology may be a new concept for a number of us. But this is one of the fields that is currently enabling uh, scientists and other people to be able to design systems that can be able to be uh, used for more efficient uh, work or even completely designing like new systems or optimizing biological systems. And you, me and you can agree that. Uh, there are a number of challenges that we have faced as the globe, and we need to change na the narrative from what we've been doing and embrace the new technologies that are currently coming up. So synthetic biology is one of those, and therefore we are championing the adoption of this new technology on the African continent. But doing all that, we appreciate so much that there are risks that come with all these new technologies. And because of that, we have gone ahead to think about what are the things that we can put in place to ensure that despite these technologies being adopted, we can still um, have, uh, we can still have the opportunities that they offer but at the same time, prevent the negative, um, the negative consequences of what these technologies come with. And that is why we are here today and talking about the GCBR uh, project. So for that, as in BioAfrica, we are really, really so glad that we are having new people come on board. We are getting to have uh, new teams of people that we, can, that we can work with, and we are looking forward to a number of collaborations beyond this uh, workshop and to see how we can champion all these technologies across the continent. So that was basically um, an introduction of what uh, Synbio Africa does, and uh, in relation to this particular project, and I really, really hope from um, as a representation of Synbio Africa, we look forward to more uh, interactions, to more collaborations on even bigger projects that are going to enable us as Africa to harness the opportunities that come with the new technologies that are coming on board, but also stopping any uh, harmful risks that come with these technologies. So thank you so much, and uh, I hope you'll have a great stay here, 
and I believe we'll be able to learn so much from the speakers of the workshop for the three days that we are going to be here. Thank you so much and welcome once again. Thank you very much, Madam Chairperson. I'm going to introduce quickly our first facilitator of the day. Yes, so our first facilitator of the day, who is uh, going to give us a brief introduction, uh, not brief, <laughs> but an introduction to GCBRs, is Dr. Stephen Opio. Dr. Stephen Opio is a bioinformatics research scientist at the Ohio State University, Columbus, Ohio, USA, an affiliated scientist at the Biosciences Eastern and Central Africa, BICA, at best at here in Nairobi, Kenya, a data scientist and the co-founder of Patera Data Science, Sostaville, a visiting scientist at the University of Sacred Heart, Gulu, Uganda, a time data no, uh, consultant for Noya District, Uganda, in reducing gender-based violence using real-time data, a core team member of Sinway Africa, and a co-founder of Mkele, an African synthetic biology innovation startup. He obtained his PhD in bioinformatics and a Master of Science from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, USA, and postdoctoral training at the same university where he developed interest in data science and big data. His area of synthetic biology is the application of artificial intelligence and computational modeling in building predictive models of the complex genetic networks that determine the function of living cells. Synthetic biology, artificial intelligence, biotechnology, bioinformatics, and data science have enabled researchers in many developed countries to make significant advances in diverse research areas such as virus discovery, diagnostics and handling, and preventing biological threats. In Africa, however, extremely wide disparities exist in human resource and infrastructure capacities to access and fully exploit the application scope of synthetic biology, artificial intelligence, and genomics. In the last seven years, Dr. Stephen has been supervising, mentoring, collaborating, and training students, fellows, postdocs, and scientists from Eastern, Central, and Southern Africa. In addition, he works as a consultant in the private sector, both in developed and developing countries. So ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming our very first facilitator, Dr. Stephen Opio. Well, thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. Um, as I mentioned before, my name is Stephen Opio. I think he has already told you uh, about me. I'm the first speaker, and my topic today, introduction to uh, global biological catastrophic risk. So uh, I would just like you to know that we are all here to learn. Uh, this is a new field, and uh, most of the work I'll be presenting are from the literature. And, 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 and uh, I would like us to uh, discuss this so that on, on, uh, on Africa perspective. Okay, so this is how I'm going to present my, my talk. I'm going to talk briefly about global, global biological catastrophic risk. I, I didn't highlight this because you already have that information in the notebook. So I will not spend uh, much time there, but I will just share with you. And then I will spend time talking about the characteristics of pathogens, most likely to cause pandemics and global catastrophics. And then I'll also I'll conclude with the biotechnology and, and GCBR. So, I'm just going to read this by Vatem from uh, Source and Span in 2017, as I mentioned before, it's a new field. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so I'm just going to read this by Vatem from uh, this uh, Chopin and Al. So, Global Catastrophic Biological Risk, which we always call GCBR, is a special category of risk involving biological agents, whether it's natural emerging, re-emerging, deliberately created, released, 
for laboratory engineer, escape that could lead to sudden, extraordinary widespread disaster beyond collective capability. Look here, collective of national, international organization and private sector to control. So it cannot be controlled by the national, international organization and, and the private sector. So this is a new field and just evolving, okay? So I'm going to share from the notebook uh, what uh, is in the notebook with, with people from for, uh, on, online. So what are the characteristics of GCPR? So what distinguishes GCPR from other threats? So the, the event has to be catastrophic that cannot be controlled by the government, international relationship, also with economic society and global security. So it also has to be unique and also as responsible to medical treatment. And then it also be at be by society, a biological event that, that cause mass causalities. Cannot be a negative if fatality will present future consequences and humanity and could not be like okay. So what can be done to address this C B R? So we have several strategies can but can be done. That's why we are here. We have advocacy for decision makers to prioritize against this GCBR. Then create platforms that aim to stopping non-state actors from de developing these uh, biological weapons. Develop research, innovation for early detection of GCBR, and invest in capacity development for, for, for the biosafety and the biosecurity and also the biodefense. Okay. So I want to share with that. Now I'm going to go back to my slide. OK, so as I mentioned before, this is a new field, and I'm going to talk mainly about what has been published there. So I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking about the characteristics of pathogen that are most likely to cause pandemic, and then the global catastrophe. And then I will conclude by the application of biotechnology in GCPR. So what are the characteristics of pathogens that are most likely to cause this pandemic? One, RNA virus are the class of microbes that are most likely to cause this GCPR. Why? Because there's the speed of the, the, the replication. Because they replicate very fast. For example, uh, hepatitis C virus can produce a trillion virons per day. And if you compare this with uh, uh, ESC parties, can produce just uh, compare in billions per day. Okay, when you go to bacteria, bacteria is most not likely to cause naturally to cause pandemic because of the uh, broad spectrum uh, that we have that limits this bacteria to cause that, unless it's engineered, fungi, fungi also is restricted. So because they are restricted thermally, they cannot cause this GCBR unless they are engineered. Other viruses, these are also the candidate for causing the GCBR because of the high speed of replication, and they also lack the broad spectrum antiviral agents. So basically, for GPBCR, the candidates are, are mainly the viruses because of what I've mentioned before, is high speed of replication. But that doesn't mean that other organisms cannot cause this BCR, because if they're engineered, then they can cause this BCR, OK? OK, currently, we, what's called viral catalog? So what's, what's, what's being done with viral catalog? So they're using that predicting pandemic, but viral cataloging is not basically can cause pandemic because, uh, for example, what people are trying to do is cataloging all these viruses by sequencing them, but some of these viruses may not cause pandemic. And then the viruses that may cause pandemic, they have not yet been identified. So viral cataloging might not cause GCBR. Okay, because you can catalog these viruses, you can use it for, for scientific discovery, but most of them cannot cause DCBR. 
the ones that can cause this disease, they are not even yet been identified. Okay. Okay. So another thing that can cause this is just syndrome diagnostics for making specific diagnostics. So syndrome diagnosis basically is not specific. You can maybe diagnose sepsis, pneumonia, and so forth. So that one, at least, if people take that, you can use the patent to try to control and identify uh, the cause of, of, of pandemic. So if you go and we go and start doing syndrome diagnostics, then we may be able to identify pathogen that, that can cause uh, the GCBRS. Human factors. Human factors can elevate a uh, pathogen to cause GCBRS. I mentioned about fungi and bacteria. Unless they're engineered, uh, they might not cause GCBRS, but if you bring in human factors, for example, gaps in hospital preparedness, medical countermeasures, those ones can cause this organism to, 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 for, for GCPR. Another example is scientific mistakes. Scientific mistakes based on human errors or misidentifying microbes, that can also lead to GCPR. Okay? So what's the recommendation? So to prepare for this GCPR threats, we should acknowledge the characteristics that are poses the greatest danger, especially from viruses. And then the pathogen listed based approach, are they not sufficient to address this period? We should improve human interaction with respiratory viruses. And then we also should increase the emphasis on developing specific pipeline of virus and viruses because that is the, 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 the way that most of these of viruses uh, cause pandemic, okay? Okay, another recommendation is we should have a clinical research that at least optimize the treatment of respiratory trade viruses because that's basically, this GCBR viruses will go through the respiratory system, okay? And now, again, also, the last but not least is uh, pursue uh, initiative that uh, will take into account the syndrome uh, way of a routine of a, a, a diagnostic of uh, the viruses. Okay, so what I've been talking about is basically natural, but what about biotechnology? Because when we use biotechnology, we can, the, the game of, can be changed completely. Biotechnology is very important and it has done very many good things. For example, Drug manufacturing, biomedication, tissue engineering, crop production, biosafety, and biosafety, and others. But biotechnology can also cause harm. So, what's the role of biotechnology in GCBR? There are two that can lead to GCBR if we misuse biotechnology. One is recreating pathogens. Or the ones that already been exits. So recently, I think they sequence one of the virus that has been extinct. So another thing is modifying viral or bacterial genomes. You can now create artificial DNA and can be used for bioweapons. So biotechnology can change what I've been discussing previously completely. Okay? So with that, I open the door or the floor for discussion and thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Steven. So whoever has a question or a comment to add, simply raise up your hand and I bring the microphone over to you. Any question or comment? Thank you, Stephen, for that presentation. Uh, my worry is the, the, the nature we have nowadays, like where we have open access uh, data, and uh, we try to, to emphasize that so much. 
how will the, the data be globally accessible. But unfortunately now with the biotech where you can change the dynamics of what you have just spoken. I suppose maybe now a pathogen that uh, you sequence and then you upload the data in the, you know, in a, a place where it's accessible. And you have the people accessing, they have no vetting mechanism. And then they, they, they engineer it and then manipulate it. Does it mean now that maybe the best place then to do, or the best thing to do is then to limit the accessibility of the data? Because now with the open access, now the biotechnology becomes again another risk. That, that, that's a very good question. Uh, right now, what they're trying to create, especially in people working in authentic biology, okay. as for people working in authentic biology, they, they've created a, a, a committee, a consortium that uh, if you're ordering some of this uh, engineered uh, DNA, you have to go through a process. Uh, I have, uh, I'm working with uh, my colleagues in uh, Zimbabwe. We're trying to uh, create a pipeline for producing biosynthetic plastic using uh, cyanobacteria and E. coli. So we tried through the databases, we could not get the sequences, but then we have to go through uh, some of these companies like Peace Bioscience and a company in, in Germany. They could not give us those sequences until we went through a, a, a very rigorous process to, to prove that we are not going to use it for, for bioweapon. So you're right, uh, people can dispose of those uh, sequences in the database, but the ones that are really, really very dangerous, they are being uh, developed by companies and they, are, they have a, a mechanism that can follow. And, and to follow on that, I think, especially for us in Africa, how can we come up with a system that will prevent us from falling in such a, in, in, on such trap? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other comment or question? Dr. Steven? Yeah. Um, Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, two things came to mind. One is that we have a lot of uh, initiatives going on in Africa, uh, not directly linked to, uh, to um, um, biotechnology, but in the, the area of uh, biological risk. So I think it would be a good idea to try to do an inventory of these act ongoing activities funded by CDC, FAO, WHO, USAID, but also uh, another element is um, uh, in research, and you talked about the risk of bio, or the bio risk. Uh, we have uh, internal review boards. The IRB system is very weak in our universities in Africa and research in general. Some countries are more advanced than others, so that's a very area where we should work, uh, focus attention as well to avoid the. Um, risks of catastrophe uh, that may come from biological um, products. Thank you very much. Okay, let, 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 me, uh, let, me, let me follow on that. So uh, how do we in Africa, because as you said, we're already having some of this organization doing that. How do we make sure that we strengthen those organization? How, do we do, how can we do that in Africa? Because you, the, the organization that may be doing some of those things, how can we bring them together so that we make stronger, the, the consortium stronger? Yeah, I think um, this forum is a good starting point. And, uh, um, and capacity building, you know, and sharing information. So I think SendBio Africa is a platform where we can exchange ideas and information. So I think this is a good starting point so to start the discussion. Um, and I believe we do not know exactly what's going on in all countries. So if we start involving people from those countries, 
we will get more information that we can you know put together and start sharing so i think that's uh, the only way to go to go and capacity building i know some universities they, are, they don't have uh, irb committees are they doing research but there's no irb committees then they all the, the, th the time they get uh, uh, the, the, the uh, irb information when they start looking at publishing and then the public the, the journal tells them no uh, you need have to show that uh, the research was approved by irb committee and then they start saying, oh we didn't know about these irb committees that they, they exist so it's about developing capacity and those came and also sharing information but i think this is a good start good platform to start with thank you very much yeah uh, thank you very much, Prof. Uh, Gafuka and Prof. Uh, Stephen. Uh, and uh, I really appreciate the questions coming from uh, Prof. Um, Kemri on the access to the data, which are mostly the digital sequence information coming from what may, we may have developed. And uh, you know, that is a very uh, hot point now on discussion things. People started preparing for the COP15. That will be in China sometime next, uh, this year or next year, we don't know yet. Because the issue of access and benefit sharing is a very burning issue now also. And access, he mentioned one thing, the, 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 the pathogens that we don't know yet. It's difficult to control them, but once you know them also, we can anticipate on a few things. It means things like development of vaccines will be going from it, and successful vaccine development, for example, will be depending on access to those, uh, to that sec digital sequence of information. And we saw what happened a bit on the COVID vaccines developed by China in a few days. The sequence, the first COVID uh, SARS, uh, SARS CoV sequence developed by China in a few days, shared, and in a few days, others also have developed the, the vaccines. Now, how are people benefiting from it? Of course, this is in the domain of health, where there is a special regulation for that, where things are supposed to be facilitated. But we are also in the domain of biotechnologies and industry where a lot of advantages may be coming. It means this aspect of digital access to sequence information may be very key for us. And that's why it's also important if you are in Uganda and we discover a pathogen here in Uganda, which have maybe that global risk, and we want to protect the world, how do we? have ownership on what we are developing and how do we make sure that the world recognize what we have done here but at the national level we need also to have these platforms of discussion to see what are the strategy and this is why in all countries now we have the uh, nagoya protocol and access and benefit sharing discussions going on with specific regulations according to the national law. The regulation on access and benefit sharing in Uganda is not the same and in Kenya, etc. But when we have this platform also, we need to be looking at how we harmonize the system. Because Uganda is sharing the same border with uh, Kenya, for example, and probably the same population, the same animals, the same pathogens circulating. Now, how can we use such platform to raise such issue and take our idea to the discussion platform? Next, uh, one week from here, there will be that UN meeting in Nairobi, one week, to discuss on this issue to prepare for the COP15. So what is coming from Camry, what is coming from Makerere or from Naro, et cetera, and how do we put all that together to make sure that we have a common but strong voice on access to material. Because one of the things is also we need to know that uh, someone say we are poor country, but someone say we are less equipped country, and someone is also saying 
we just lack technology. And the key thing is there, technology, bad technology. How do we make sure that we can run at the same speed with these bad technologies and harness the powerful, the power uh, of that digital sequence information and the data to anticipate and to predict what we have to do? Thank you. Thank you very much. This is a question to my colleague. We are both from the US. I, I'm, I'm going to throw this to you. We work with scientists from Africa, and sometimes they ship their data to us, or sample to us, and when we publish, sometimes we don't even mention them. How can we make sure that the samples that are shipped there uh, and the, the, the information is owned by Africans? Yeah. I believe that is also landing on the table of uh, access to information and tracking, tracing and tracking data. And that is what is also going to be discussed uh, next week during the DSI meeting, the fourth DSI meeting in, in Nairobi. And uh, we are working with uh, GIZ and some other German organizations and the uh, Digital Sequence Information Network, Scientific Network also, where they are putting in place a system of tracking. And if you use their platform, you can almost map all sequence information obtained from material coming from Uganda. Where was it published? What was the reference number in the gene banks, for example? And we use that. So, if we can, and that's why capacity building in such activities will be very important to empower our scientists also to do such things. And someone sitting in the ministry, for example, in the Ministry of Health in Uganda or, or NARO or whatever institutions, should be there to check on weekly or daily basis. What has gone out from Uganda to contribute to world knowledge and what is Uganda benefiting from it? But how do we make sure that? Uganda is benefiting from it. And this is where the regulation on access and the national regulation on access and benefit sharing is coming. Where before everything is sent out, you have the prime informed consent from local authority, you have the mutual agreed term, you have even the, 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 the scientific the research authorization from Ministry of Science or Scientific Research in Uganda. But before it is shipped to the partner in the US, there is a need for the material transfer agreement. And all the Ugandan regulation, for example, should be part of these documents, so that at the end, we know that this is what is supposed to come, to, to come back to Uganda. It can be monetary or non-monetary benefit, it can be capacity building, it can be one sequencer to be given, it can be number of PhD to be, Drain in Uganda, for example. And so we need to have this, and such kind of capacity building may also come as part of such initiative. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I think my time is almost up. Uh, I will just uh, thank you again, and uh, this is just the beginning, and uh, we'll look forward to collaborating with everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Steven. And thank you to the, the participants who have engaged him. This is what we are expecting for the rest of the day, given that all of us have a bit of experience and knowledge in this matter. So ask questions, contribute, comment, make an addition, so that by the end of the day, we are all better for it as we get back to our respective countries to continue working in the same line. So at this point in time, I'm going to introduce our next facilitator, Mr. Peter Haiba Bigumira, who will be talking about Africa's experience so far with GCBRs. Peter Haiba Bigumira is a pharmacist with health diplomacy, health system strengthening, and public health technical expertise. His research focuses on biosecurity and microbial resistance, and emergency preparedness. He works with the Infectious Disease Institute at the College of Health Sciences at Makere University. He serves with the Secretariat for Uganda's co-chair with the Africa CDC of the Global Health 
Security Agenda Action Package on Biosafety and Biosecurity for 2021-2022. We served in a similar capacity in 2019-2020 period as Uganda chaired the Action Package on, on Antimicrobial Resistance. He is attached to the Uganda Ministry of Health, Public Health Emergency Operations Center as a technical advisor for emergency preparedness and response. He coordinates the surge team at the COVID-19 Situation Room, a specialized public health emergency operations center for COVID-19. He supports international health regulation implementation, monitoring, and evaluation. He actively participated in the organization and conducting of joint external evaluation after action review and simulation exercises. During a global technical consultation on pandemic preparedness in 2018, he took the initiative to show Uganda's participation in a pilot program for the World Health Organization support for pandemic preparedness, even though you were not part of the original pilot. After two successful workshops, we completed a situational analysis and drafted the respiratory pathogen preparedness and response plan. These documents served as the basis for our response. When we say our, we are referring to Uganda in this case, for our response during the COVID-19 pandemic. His work as an epidemic intelligence analyst was key in the, in the identification of what we now refer to as SARS-CoV-2 in January 2020 through TweetDeck and its prioritization for action by the National Task Force. He currently leads event-based surveillance for bacterial meningitis and chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear events through epidemic intelligence from open source system. He supports risk assessment, contingency planning, training and coordination. He also actively supports the work of the incident commanders, incident management teams for COVID-19 and past Ebola virus disease outbreaks. Recent projects include development and implementation of a public health emergency management training curriculum for district health leadership. This has been adopt, adopted and used for orientation of new regional EOCs and NGO teams. In addition to completing several on-site and remote certificate trainings, Peter received a Bachelor of Pharmacy in 2013 from Mbarara University of Science and Technology. So I believe by the end of that long introduction, we now appreciate where he'll be in position to share with us Africa's experience so far with ECBR-like events. At such a point in time, I would like to welcome Mr. Peter Ahabab Gumira to facilitate us in the next session. Thank you. As he presents, let's take notes, let's prepare questions so that after his presentation, you're ready to fire away. Thank you so much, and good morning again, ladies and gentlemen. So, for those, I know many of us here come from a science background, but we are going to have a little bit of a history lesson. And I think it's important because it's through reflecting on the past that we will be able to refine our thinking and ideas of what to do moving forward. As an African, as an, as an African scientist or scholar, I always struggle with the question, do we really have nothing that we can learn from our own African experiences to guide our decision making? Must all our strategies and plans come from studying what other continents or other countries have done? So after just rehashing the definitions, I will present three scenarios of GCBRs, and then we'll look at the near GCBRs from antiquity to the Middle Ages. So this is BC to around 1500 AD. Then we'll look at cholera and the third plague in the 19th century. We'll then have a focus on pandemic influenza, and then we'll look at recent history, which is the 21st century until present. And then finally, we'll look at the timeline and try to draw some conclusions. 
So I know definitely we usually say biosafety is protecting the humans from the bugs, like in a lab, and biosecurity is protecting the bugs from the human. But in this presentation, when I say biosecurity, I'm looking at it from a more broader view of protecting humans as a species or their existence. So just for this particular presentation, when I say biosecurity, I'm not talking about a lab. I'm talking more about how do we safeguard humanity as an existence. And then um, global catastrophic biological risks, they are well defined in the present, previous presentations, so I will not repeat. So we have three main scenarios. Why do I say scenarios? It's because global catastrophic biologic risks are extinction level events, hundreds of millions dead. We don't have any real life example because it has not happened during our existence for the last 200,000 years. If we are 7 billion people on Earth, I'm talking about an event that can kill off a billion people in, a sh in short order, or 6 billion people and leave just the 1 billion. And we do not have an experience with this. So of course we have natural pandemics, but then we also have accidental and deliberate release of engineered pathogens like the previous present, uh, presenter went through so much effort to help us understand that naturally, a naturally occurring existing extinction event is not likely to happen before 200 to 1 billion years of our existence. And we've just tried to clear 200,000. So we have not yet reached that level where we would have a natural extinction event. What we worry more about is a accidental release of a specifically engineered pathogen or a deliberate release. So when I talked about the level of risk, um, I, my background right in the EOC is emergency management. So we have incidents, like when we say we have Ebola, one, two, three, four, five people. But then we also have events which where you have mortality in the tens to thousands. Then we have disasters, where you have mortality in the thousands to ten, hundreds of thousands. Then we have a crisis, when people talk about a crisis and the UN is being mobilized and all people are coming in. We are looking at hundreds of thousands to hundreds of millions. Now, a global catastrophic risk, we are looking at hundreds of millions of deaths. This could be anything from climate change freezing over the whole planet, or a biologic event, or an asteroid hitting the planet. And then finally, existential risk. We are saying this is something that can finish off the whole species. So um, when I talked about biosecurity, one of the statements we use a lot in emergency preparedness and response is, a dollar for preparedness saves $16 for response. And similarly, um, by biosecurity, I mean safeguarding the species. If we invest now, things like this initiative or this workshop, investments made now are saving us costs down the chain. And this shows you how there's an expansion, exponential rise in costs per life year save when you wait for the event to reach that level of being a catastrophic risk. So, like I said, we don't have any GCBRs that we can mention, but we have near GCBRs. If you notice, um, this is just a highlight of three, but I'll go into details. This one, I wanted to mainly show the statistics. The plague of Justinian killed three to 13% of the world's population, and these were 6 to 25 million people, something like Uganda's population. But at that time, they made up 3 to 13% of the world's population. And then if you move, so this is around the 541 to 542 AD. Now just jump a thousand years down the road, and then you have 10% of the world's population being killed off during the Black Death. And this was 20 to 70 million people. 
as you see, the scale that the world's population increased and the amount of death required to categorize the GCBR or the near GCBR went up. Jump again another 500 years. The Spanish influenza, 500 or so, yeah. The Spanish influenza killed 50 to 100 million people. But this was 3% of the world's population. So imagine in 2022, an event that can kill off 7 million people. That's 10% of our world's population. We, we can't even imagine it in your head. Uganda has 40 million people. An event that can kill off 4 million Ugandans. You get the point. So we do not have GCBRs, but we have NIA. They just try to help us understand. So why is Africa so vulnerable to GCBRs per se? We have so many belts. We have the meningitis belt. We have a lot of refugees. So there's intermixing of populations. Today I'm a Ugandan, tomorrow I'm a Ugandan refugee. Things stabilize, I go back. Where I had gone, my neighbor now comes to visit me, is now a refugee. We have uh, the yellow fever belt, the meningitis belt. We have globalization, you know, trade, travel, porous borders. We have climate change. We have terrorism. Many of our countries, if you look at the Global Health Security Index, many of our countries score at zero in dual use research. We are now dual use research havens. I can give a, an unrelated thing um, use of formula in kids under 1.5 kgs is not advised because it causes necrosis in the gut. Someone was able to secure IRB approval to do a, a trial in Africa in children under 1.5 kgs. So you realize due to challenges, I think with regulation and stuff, we become risk havens for people who want to do particularly dubious research. Um, and then of course, you know, the climate, we have the rich, the weather, and it's just a melting pot of issues. So uh, we are going to first look at four, plagues. Um, we're going to look at the plague of Athens, the Antonine plague, the plague of Justinian, and the Black Death. So in preparing my presentation, I focused more on how these plagues affected Africa, or which lessons we should get. So I'll not go into so many details about the plagues themselves. Now, one thing um, you may not know is the methods used in trying to dis discover this um, a merge between archaeology, history, and epidemiology. So it's a kind of histor histor historical epidemiology where you study ancient African societies and then you try to infer what could have been the epidemiological situation at that time. So it's a lot of inference. Another key thing for this time period is pre-colonial Africa did not have the large organized city-states or cities. You had the clans, the tribes, and the smaller kingdoms distributed all over the place. And then large swaths of land surrounding them, allowing them the flexibility and mobility to resettle within their same area. So for example, Ugandans can't abandon Uganda and go to the east, they'll find Kenya. But in those days, you could abandon a whole area and, re and resettle. So, um, much even before the first mentioning of plagues, and I say this because of Egypt, we have the plagues in the Bible, which are also mentioned in the Quran. They talked about lice, diseased livestock, boils, and when you look at them, you can infer that these might have been infectious diseases, zoonoses, or even parasitoses. Now, the plague of Athens is a very interesting plague because it occurred around a war between Athens and Sparta. Later on, when we look at the Spanish influenza, guess what? It will be an epidemic that was spread faster due to World War I. So it's interesting how there's really nothing new under the sun. So these guys had their war, and with war, you mobilize troops, resources, a lot of movement, and that catalyzed the spread of the plague. And it was able, 
So they say that this plague originated in Ethiopia. And from Ethiopia, it moved through Egypt and then Greece, because there was a lot of stuff happening around the Delta, the Nile River. And because there's not a lot of information of Uganda, I often wonder, so if Uganda is the source of the Nile, and a lot of the things I'll mention talk about Ethiopia, Egypt, Ethiopia, Egypt, what was the situation in Uganda? So it started in Ethiopia, moved through Egypt, and when it went through to these organized city-states, it decimated their populations. Like I mentioned earlier, we did not have such structures such as organized city-states or crowding of people around cities or kings and all that. We had more of the kingdom kind of, our kind of kingdom, clans and tribes. So it's interesting to note that there, at this point, there are, there are, thinking was, I would say, rudimental. For example, they looked at purification, incantation, and then they told people all together, don't bathe, don't eat food, because the one who ate it died. So it shows you they had a very backward way of thinking at that time. Um, move forward, you have the Antonine Pledge. Now, this one, again, Egypt is what we are looking at. We are going to see a lot of our things have to do with North Africa, since it was part of the Roman, the Greek, and all these other empires. But what's very interesting is, unlike the plague of Athens, which was geographically limited, like I said, it started in Africa, but when it got to crowded cities, it really wreaked havoc there. This one, for it, was spread across a vast territory. And they, it, it, it's thought to have been caused by smallpox. Um, and unlike the plague of Athens, it moved through vast territory. And some of the things that catalyzed it coming up was the Roman Empire was very strong economically and was politically integrated. So the same things like the formation of cities and kingdoms and people crowding made it spread much faster. But one of the interesting things is the effect. It after it went out, it left that Roman Empire severely weakened. And this is a, is a foreshadowing of how these catastrophic events, they, they do not just stop at the level of COVID or Ebola, where you know, people are suffering. We are talking about whole governments collapsing, whole governments. And you just enter this state of lawlessness, where everyone decides to do what they do and everything. So. Moving forward, we have the plague of Justinian. Now, it's funny, at that time, they really believed the world was coming to an end. And it was dubbed the all-consuming and all-destroying plague. And it broke out. They say that it first originated again, like I mentioned, in the Nile Delta in 541. And subsequently, it broke out in 18 consecutive upsurges over 200 years. Now, nowadays we talk about COVID surges every six months, every year. But here we are talking about surges every couple of years or decades. So eventually it disappeared in 1755. One important thing to note is it generally followed trading routes, providing an exchange of infection as well as goods. And sailors were annihilated. In a map I'll show you later, you'll be so interested around how the port or coastal towns would be affected versus inland towns. Now, this outbreak plagued Africa, Asia, and Europe. And one interesting thing is that um, there's not a lot known about what public health measures were used during this time. Probably the historians at the time also died off. Now, in between these two time periods, I want to present a case of a uh, site named Ketu. It's Mapungubwe, and it's a World Heritage Site. Now, this site was, it's in Africa, and they expect that this civilization lived around AD 1000 and AD 1200. But one of the things that they found very interesting is that um, these guys had a well-developed local and regional economy and that fed into international networks of exchange with the Indian Ocean Rim, Swahili towns of East Africa as, as conduits. And this place is in Zimbabwe, so you can just see 
from Zimbabwe to East Africa. Now, they found that the, there was an unusually high number of barriers, 94, 76 of which belonged to infants uh, in the age category of 0 to 4, which translates to a mortality rate of 5%. So again, 40 million Ugandans, 5% of them dying. Or if we said 20, half of Ugandans are children. So if half of Uganda's population are youth, right? and 5% of them die. But this is the very interesting thing about what these people did. So there's evidence that the entire settlement was abandoned. Very interesting. They had a strong economy. Rather than sticking to the place or trying to die with the city, they abandoned the whole settlement. And um, this coincides with the time of the barriers. And that means that the pandemic prompted their, the community to shift. So we move further down to the Black Death. It originated in Central Asia, and there were galleys from Genoa that were sailing from the Black Sea, going to Sicily, and it quickly spread through the world. Now, it even lasted over 500 years. So why is the Black Death interesting? Now I'll take you to Ghana. Now, archaeological work in Ghana found that there was a very thriving community um, in a place known as Akora. And these guys, um, they had agriculture, economy, and everything. But the interesting thing is they abandoned their entire settlement. They abandoned the whole thing. And the period of abandonment coincides with the the time of the devastation of the Black Death. So I've brought you from Antonin, Justinian, the Black Death, and now we are going to move towards the next period. Here we are going to look at cholera. Now the key thing I want you to take away from cholera is it's a waterborne disease, and most of the water-rich areas around Africa at that time irrigation was not widespread and all that and many of the inland water bodies were not directly connected to the oceans so we had the first cholera pandemic from 1817 to 24 then the second one 27 to 37 then the third 39 to 56 then in between there was a plague um, epidemic um, from 86 sorry that's 1886 to 1920, we had a fourth cholera in 63 to 75, a fifth in 81 to 96. So you're asking, Peter, so what's the point? So the point is if you look at this map. So this map is showing you the movement patterns for the third, fourth, and fifth cholera epidemic. I think you can all see a pattern here. A lot of the stuff is happening around Cities, cities or places that have direct access to shipping routes or coastal towns. So later on when I tell you port health is important, you'll understand from this. So now the third plague, this uh, originated from Central Asia, exploding in China in 1855, spread around the world, devastated. Um, very many places such as Cape Town and other cities, Buenos Aires and whatever. Now, it's especially interesting the effect it had on Senegal. Uh, Senegal was hit hard by it in 1914, and it disrupted the country for 30 whole years. It set them back. Um, and the measures at that time included surveillance system, maritime quarantines, and isolation of victims. See how far we've come from praying, incantations, and telling people, you know? So we're making progress. People are learning. So now we are going for a huge shift. If you look at 1980 versus 1931, if you see still by 1980, we were not clustered so much into nations or states. We still had a very disseminated way of life. 
and come to 1913, we were almost all entirely colonized. So now we were organized into blocks. So this set the stage for influenza. The first influenza was the Russian flu. Then we had the Spanish flu, the Asian, the Hong Kong. Then we had the corona viruses. They, they are cousins, so they are usually put together. SARS, swine flu, MERS, and COVID-19. So the Russian flu spread a, a lot around that, but not much is known about the effect in Africa. I want to really focus more on the 20th century influenza, as you can see, the main ones talked about are the Spanish, the Asian, and the Hong Kong. But the variants, rather the H's I mentioned there, you have H1 had its time, H2, H3, H1 came back, H7, H5, H9, and then now the one we're mainly looking at is avian influenza as the one having the highest potential to cause a, 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 a GCBR. So the 1918 was known as the mother of all pandemics and H1N1 is the ancestor of the current influenza viruses. And I want to interest you in, look at how it moved. So the black line is the first wave, the red line is the second wave, and the green line is the third wave. So if you notice, like I told you, war, if you go back to Athens versus Sparta, similarly here, the World War I between the Axis countries and the West and the Allies, that was the first wave. But then the second wave is where you now have that real natural you know, progression of the epidemic. I found it very interesting that much of the central parts of Africa managed to escape the first and second waves, but then the third wave really settled down in at that point. So um, digging further in, this map shows you the first wave in white, and then the second wave spread through several colors, and then the third wave. But still, don't you just find it interesting? And I feel like we really need to have a greater focus on port health or border health, because clearly we've seen from this history of Africa's experience with pandemics, that can Africa as it is today, if there was a GCBR, I remember at some point during COVID, New Zealand and Australia closed off themselves, but they have self-sustaining self systems. They can close off themselves. Ask ourselves, can Africa as a continent, during a GCBR event, close off all its waterways and airlines and say, <laughs> As African countries, we are going to self-sustain ourselves until it's safe. Can we? Because as you can see, all these movements, it would usually start in these port towns or these coastal towns. So the Spanish influenza, the severity was very bad, and it was acute in Africa. Nearly 2% of Africa's population is estimated to have died within six months. Ladies and gentlemen, 2% of Africa's population dying in six months. Just imagine. So they say 2.5 out of an estimated 130 million people died. So at that time, we we're dealing with 130 million people. How many people are in Africa today? Now imagine that same 2 point, that same 2% 2 of this current population dies off in six months. Just the mass barriers, right? So they, it's, it, it had a particular, they say that it had um, infection rates of up to 90% of the population and mortality rates of up to 15%. So it was especially bad in South Africa. Um, again, the port town, Cape Town, and I think you've noticed a trend every time I bring up a, 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 a pandemic, Cape Town, you know? So it was especially bad, and uh, even in West Africa, the speed at which it ravaged Freetown, Sierra Leone was struggling. 4% of Freetown's population died in three weeks. And uh, in East Africa, the pandemic killed 4 to 6% of Kenya's population in nine months. 
um, in many parts of the continent, medical facilities were overwhelmed. So the Asian flu <clears throat> had a very limited impact in the African area. We also had the Hong Kong influenza around 1968. And um, so we moved from the sixth cholera, 1 million people, third plague, 12 million people, Spanish flu, 40 to 50 million people, the Russian, 1 million people. HIV AIDS, now HIV AIDS is interesting because very many people have described it as a slow moving pandemic. Um, then we had the Asian flu, the Hong Kong flu, swine flu, SARS, MERS, COVID-19. So I will not dwell so much on the recent ones since so much is known about them. So what are the, what are the some of the takeaways I think we can learn from the past? Uh, first of all, in African indigenous in African indigenous knowledge systems, burning settlements or forests was an established way of managing diseases before either reoccupying them or shifting homesteads to new locations. And post-pandemic, houses were not rebuilt. Uh, my brother Bagash can tell you we have corridors in Uganda for anthrax, and Rift Valley fever. And whenever there's a rainy season, we have resurgence. One of the working theories is people bury carcasses, infected carcasses. And when the rain comes or, or some kind of floods or something, they unearth these carcasses, expose the spores to the environment again, and then lead to a new wave of infections of Rift Valley fever, um, anthrax and all that. So we have these corridors and they are known. But you see what these guys did? Before they resettled an area, they cleared everything. Didn't bury, burnt. Another key thing is layout of settlements was important. These ancestors of ours never crowded in cities. Never. So they did it such that they were able to stay at a distance from each other, but not too far apart to engage in daily care, support, and cooperation. This made it very easy for them to isolate whole sections of the community if an infectious disease was suspected. They had no microscopes. They had no epidemiologists. Then communities knew that outbreaks were unpredictable but possible, so they built settlements in dispersed versions. Here in Africa, it shocks me how we are struggling to crowd in cities and build high rises rather than adopting satellite city models. It would be much more easy to have lockdowns or cordon sanitaires if you had a satellite city because if you lock down in Tinder, in Tinder residents can move within in Tinder. They can access their supermarkets, banks, hospitals without mixing with Nigeria or Naria. But now because we've built such interdependent systems, when you close one part of town, people start crying. But these guys, the way they built their settlements, by design, they spaced themselves out such that if something happened, you had some breathing space. Then also, their behaviors were augmented by diversified diets. A lot of us have become huge fans of fast food and sedentary life. But these folks just never allowed that to catch up with them. And finally, um, keeping the point of the, like the Shona people in the 17th and 18th centuries, it is there's evidence that they isolated people suffering from infectious diseases, such as leprosy in temporary residential structures. So I wonder at which point we started having these burial practices of people touching and what. I really wonder, but I think at some point, we forgot the lessons of our ancestors. So my pre the previous presenter went into this, so I won't repeat. But basically, the pathogens we saw, bacteria was active in the beginning. And then later, we moved to more vi viruses. And uh, fungi have always been on the bench. They have never played the match. So we can conclude that viruses are more likely to cause CGBRs than bacteria, than, than fungi. And also, like he said also, RNA is more likely than DNA to cause problems. 
Now, another interesting thing is if you look at the optimal virulence, it's like there's a natural balance. The diseases with high case fatalities have lower reproductive numbers, and diseases with higher reproductive numbers have lower case fatalities. And I still want to agree with my brother. We are more likely to suffer from engineered pathogens, not naturally occurring pathogens. So my conclusions, um, you may think your senior pestis is out, that plague has been figured out, but let me shock you. It, is, it can be aerolyzed for use as a bioweapon, and it's considered as a category A pathogen. That is, it can easily be disseminated or transmitted from person to person, it cause high mortality rates, and have potential for major public health impact. And guess what? We don't have a plague vaccine. It's one of those neglected vaccines. So it could be a very good target for malicious actors. Cholera cannot be eradicated as it's, natural, it's a natural inhabitant of aquatic systems, meaning wash programs are key. And finally, um, development of universal vaccines are very important because we need to protect against all subtypes of influenza, especially the naturally, at least so you know the naturally occurring influenza is no longer an issue. So I want to conclude that our risk modifiers from what we've learned from the past, globalization of trade and travel is a huge risk modifier and how Africa deals with globalization of travel, travel over the next decades or centuries will determine how badly would be affected by future um, by future GCBRs. I, I always wonder why it's so expensive for me to travel to West Africa. It's cheaper for me to go to Dubai or the UK than to go to West Africa. We can't really be in a situation whereby you can't move within your own continent affordably, you know, because that then limits our self-sustainability and our ability to lock down literally the entire continent. So, um, land use and urbanization is another key point. We need to build sustainable cities. We need to move towards satellite city models. We need to stop crowding. When you crowd, where I live, almost all the neighbors on my street do open burning. They just throw the rubbish and set a fire because there's nowhere to properly do waste management in the city. And finally, the geographic distribution of diseases and Disease vectors and hosts is affected by climate changes and could potentially increase the spread of pathogens. Let's not ignore the potential effects of climate change. Uh, finally, key strategies, wash. We need to go back to the drawing board on wash. Vector control, surveillance, and sub sustainable cities. I know a lot of us want to focus on vaccines and all these things and MCMs and what, but Let's go back to the basics. Thank you so much for bearing with my history lesson. I will take questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Peter, for that wonderful, wonderful, wonderful session. So we shall have questions for about 10 minutes. In case someone online puts up their hand, in notify me so that they can also be able to participate in this Q&A session. So for now, I'll start with if there are any questions or comments from in-house here, as we see if there will be any from the online participants. Simply put up your hand and I bring the microphone over to you. Thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. How can we apply the past to uh, the policy, the policy of GCBR. Beg your pardon. How can I apply apply what you have learned from the past to the to, to policy of GCBR? Uh, thank you so much. So, first of all, we have to assume a GCBR will happen. Now, if it will happen, from the past we've seen that every time um, GC, um, any of these events happen. It really begins around the, the water first. Now, of course, with plane travel, the model has changed. But still, we have to ask ourselves, 
how can we better manage border health or port health in general? Very many countries have neglected port health. They have immigration, they have taxation, they have security at borders, but they do not have clear port health services. Because if you're able to control at source, if you're able to pick a potentially ill traveler from the airport and isolate him, and you do, and you know that for at least 90% of all ill travelers, you're able to pick them up at border points, whether they are ground crossings or water crossings or air crossings, then already you've cut down your risk by a whole bit. So for me, I think um, one of the big glaring lessons is port health. And then the second one, like I've told you, it's the issue of how we manage land use urbanization. It's very important. You know, there's a story in Fort Porto. People wanted to create new land for agriculture. So they cut into the forest. And then the monkeys living in the trees started kidnapping their babies. It was in the news, very interesting thing. But your first question should be, why were they trying to create land for agriculture in a forest? You get my point. So we have to have sustainable land use practices. These forests that you want to enter, they say Uganda used to have, I think, 20% forest. Now we've gone down to 9 or 4. These forests that we are entering, we are going to dig up old dinosaur monster pathogens that have been sleeping where we have zero resistance, zero, you know? So let's have more sustainable uh, land use. I think our ancestors had, they would lie to kids and say that's a sacred place or there are ghosts there or what. Now, if we reinterpret that, I think they knew that whenever we try to enter this particular place, people would get sick or they would die off. So they would now wrap it in mysticism. But us, we no longer have respect for the natural environment. We want to sell everything, reclaim all the water areas. If you look at this issue of cholera, many people are living in water places that should ideally be swamps. You know? So. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think that's a great presentation. But I think amongst the strategies, I don't know this group. I'm happy that uh, left hand Colonel Dr. Godwin is here, but I don't know whether VET or any other sectors are here, but uh, multi-sectoral and multidisciplinary action or one health approach is the way, one way to go. Because I've realized that we neglect these guys in our planning, even after even planning, we even leave them in terms of implementation. So when we go one way, definitely we'll crash. Perhaps that's one thing which we need really to implement accordingly. Yeah. And one thing what I have also seen, we've learned in Africa. Because we've been doing some work at the borders, but you see... The districts which have actually gotten these uh, outbreaks, Ebola, COVID, they have learned something. They actually are prepared more than these other districts which have not faced this. So perhaps it's something that we need to continuously uh, help these districts which are not heavily affected to get used of this. Mm. I beg to submit for now. Mm. Actually, I want to really add on to his points. I think one of the strategies that really helped us again during uh, Ebola and the like was having community-centered models. And I think even in the old African society, they, they, they lived and planned around communities. And it wasn't until the point that government really brought things down to the level of community, whereby even if, it's, even if it's a vaccination campaign, ideally it should be the... The, the local community leaders to be community champions. I think you're right. Having a One Health model and having a community-centered model are very, very key in um, having this, these practices being done.
Online participants would like to engage you as well. So in case you have questions, raise up your hand. We shall be able to let you speak. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to the presenter for bringing us back to history and what has been successful in Africa in general, managing such kind of risk. So that was really, really wonderful to know that there is nothing new, by the way, which is coming out. Mm -hmm. We can recreate world trade, millennium development, sustainable development, integrated. This is what you presented. Africa has been doing before colonization and long before it. And we saw how it has been successful. So this, mean, this means uh, we need to really, as you, you ended with it, that we need to go back to the basics. We need, need to learn from the past, from ancestral knowledge. And this is how we are going to succeed, managing whatever we are, uh, we, we are doing here. One question I will ask is just, how do we make sure that today, in the capacity building program, training of our specialists, we are taking into consideration that knowledge that you are sharing? It's nowhere in our curricula, but it was very successful. And you mentioned something that where well, I, I may disagree, that they were not having epidemiologists. Mm. They were having yeah. the best epidemiologists. Yeah. Because I would, be, I would think, don't trust my degree, but trust what I'm doing. Yeah. How am I managing the situation? Yeah. So when you see how they were managing, everything was planned. Mm anticipated mm -hmm. and even if they were not having a good system of data collection i think memory um, how do we call it uh, 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 formal knowledge mm -hmm. the knowledge they accumulated from the past were used to do a kind of modeling for themselves and mm -hmm. anticipate things mm -hmm. and this is how they knew that moving from one area to the uh, to another or starting a new area you first need to clear Clear it. So this is something very important that we need to build on. But most importantly, how do we make sure that that knowledge is really not included in our learning institute? It can be at three service level or at eight service level, training field workers, etc. We should not just be repeating what is in now with these books, etc. But let's go build on this uh, knowledge that you are sharing and see how we can really uh, be successful again, because we have been successful. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And I think um, maybe for the hosts, I think if it's possible, having a, like both his point of one health, you know, one health is not just the health people, but if at some point you can even organize with the parliamentary health committee so that you, I know our, our counterparts, the other side in the state are always in Senate presenting on these risks. But I think it's not a culture we've been having in Uganda, but it's important to have at least one session where you present to parliamentarians about uh, GCBRs, and about some of these mitigation measures, and about some of these concerns about land use, agriculture, the practices, climate change, biodiversity, such that when these policymakers are, are, are taking decisions on where the country should go, it's, they can hopefully take these things into account. At least the next time, I'm happy to see that the government opened up nine new cities, of course, the infrastructure is not yet at the level, but maybe it's to, 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 to reduce the pressure on Kampala. 
I hear, I don't have statistics, but I hear that 500,000 people live in Kampala, but on average, 4 million people access it daily from all the surrounding satellite cities. So, do we really have more sustainable models for cities in Arua, Mbale? Can some of these cities be planned differently, such that infrastructure is built in a satellite model to enable quick and efficient public health measures? I don't know. But we have to educate the policymakers first and then have a clear call to action for them to design uh, policies around how these cities are put in place. And even he raised another point, but the staffing, some of these positions in the Public Service Commission should have an, an accommodation for some of these things because ideally a district vet, every district should have a, a fully supported vet to do some of these risk assessments and, you know, biodiversity is something that's missing, but there should be someone watching the, the district environment officer should be able to say that we are concerned about work that is happening in this lake or this forest, and maybe they make a joint report with the district health office and vet office and say that we may really get in touch with some transboundary diseases or something. So I think we need to educate our policymakers and have a clear call to action for them to come up with clear policy guidance for the lower levels since we have a disseminated government system. Over. Thank you very much. We have a hand up online, so I'll ask Alex to unmute and ask your question. Then uh, Peter will be able to respond to you. Alex? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me very well? Yes, we can yes, hear we you. Can. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Peter, and thank you everyone for joining in. I'm sorry I couldn't join you physically. I'm not feeling well. Uh, my name is Alex Chabarongo. I'm a veterinary doctor. And uh, this, this topic is really, really, really important um, and well to those who have discussed it. So I have three things to talk about. One is um, about uh, pandemic preparedness, we need to look at three things most. Uh, the One Health approach, very, very important, as uh, Peter was talking about it. Um, we have a workforce that is running in the country, but we need to involve as many people as possible, uh, especially at the grassroots, because you, you, you saw that in the news, uh, I think it was last week, about um, the outbreak of uh, anthrax in the eastern region. And people were eating meat of an animal that had died of anthrax, and they also got anthrax. So this is a zoonotic infection that needs to be that needs to be alerted. So um, you 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 need to uh, look at that approach in terms of one health, so that you can be able to appreciate how people can respond to the call and how they can be able to tackle it. Then the other one is, um, and I believe IDEA is doing great work um, on, 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 on uh, One Health approach and the One Health workforce. The other thing is about biosafety and biosecurity. So uh, this is another aspect that we need to look at when we are talking about pandemic preparedness, because uh, most of, 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 of the challenges that we find is in terms of how safe our projects are, uh, for example, if the rumors are true about the Wuhan virus, uh, so how does our project affect the world and how does the world affect our project? We incorporate in the human practices uh, aspect, you know? So by safety and by security needs to be looked at and looked at keenly, especially in a growing ecosystem like this in terms of science and, and research, we have dual use research these days that people can do harm using the, uh, the pathogens that are supposed to be worked on in another way. So by changing the environment, by releasing them intentionally or unintentionally. So by safety and by security is really important. The lastly is about bi biological threat reduction. Biological threat reduction. I repeat this, we are going into an era of biological threats. Uh, in terms of, of, of pathogens, in terms of even nuclear 
uh, and, and all that. The, the UN has an office called UNODA, uh, United Nations Office of Disarmament Affairs and the Biological Weapons Convention. We need to look into how we can participate actively into this as a region. We need more efforts to reach out to see that we, we bring this to our uh, our, uh, our our doors. Um, last year, uh, actually, it was a few months ago. I happened to have participated uh, in one of the of the launches in Kenya, uh, launching the biological um, <clears throat> the BWC in Kenya, and and I happened to have talked about how youth can be able to get involved in some of these movements. So thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you so much, Peter, for your presentation, and thanks to Simbaya Africa for organizing um, a great workshop like this. I hope to join you tomorrow. Back to you, moderator. Thank you very much. Alex, do you have any comments on that, Peter? No, I just agree with him that um, those, those are very key issues. All right, so at this point, um, the participants, uh, as we go on, I think you notice that the facilitators and uh, sessions, we have here several suggestions Several suggestions keep coming up as to how we can better do preparedness, response, and management of GCBRs. So at the end of the workshop, we shall ask each one of us here to commit to what they will try to they'll work on when they get back to their respective stations in their countries. So as you go on, you can see what can apply in your either organization or country, what does not. Start at that point as you're concluding the workshop. You get to commit to what you'll implement, and then as the months go on, you shall be able to follow up and see how far you've gone in working on that. So take note of what they suggest. Uh, Stephen, Peter, they've all made wonderful suggestions, and Alex online, so that we see what we can implement and what we won't implement. So are there any other questions here? Okay, if you have no more questions, I'd like to thank once again Mr. Peter for the facilitation, thank you very much. It was a very beautiful. So before I call on the next speaker, I would like to ask those who have just joined us to introduce themselves before we move on to the last session, right before our break tea. So the new entrants, I bring the microphone over to you. you introduce yourselves that we get to know who we are talking to. So you mention your name, country, and uh, affiliation. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm called Sandra Agondeze. I'm by safety and by security expert, Uganda. Good morning, everyone. I'm Daniel Aluko affiliated to Macra University as well as Ministry of Health. I'm a certified by risk management professional. That's by safety and by security. Thank you. Yeah, good morning colleagues. I'm Gordon Pamise, the project manager joint clinical research center dealing with the uh, strengthening lab uh, systems in the country, whereby safety by security is a core strategic objective. Thank you very much. So let me introduce our next facilitator. So our next session uh, is going to be about the role of various stakeholders in managing GCBRs. We've kept hearing of one health here, one health there, that approach, this approach. So the gentleman coming in next is going to try to highlight for us the role of various stakeholders managing GCBRs. He has been an active part of response to related events here in Uganda, so we'll be able to highlight what various professions get to contribute to the response there. 
and uh, he's called uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dr. Godwin Bagash, who is a vet veterinarian with a Master of Science in Molecular Biology and Biotechnology and a Master's degree in Security Studies. He's trained and is passionate about CBRN defense. In this case, CBRN stands for Chemical, Biological, Radiological, Nuclear, and High Yield Explosives. And is also trained in biosafety and biosecurity. Currently, he's working in the Directorate of Public Health at the Chief TNC of Medical Services in the Uganda's People Defense Forces, that is our AME here in Uganda, as the head of the biosecurity department. He has worked in public health for most of the time, especially in preventive medicine. He's a convert and frontliner for One Health, a focal point person for One Health in the UPDF. He's a trainer on CBRN, that is Chemical, Biological, and Radiological and Nuclear Defense. He has participated in the joint external evaluation and in implementation of recommendations in specific technical areas since 2017 to date. He has participated in joint outbreak investigation for priority zoonotic diseases, especially for organisms with potential for bioterrorism, such as anthrax. He has also participated in joint training of district one health teams in surveillance and antimicrobial resistance. So, ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Lieutenant Colonel Dr. Godwin Bagash to facilitate us on the next. Thank you. Morning, everyone. The CEO for Symbio Africa, uh, the chairperson Symbio Africa, all participants, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Godwin Bagash to take you through stakeholders in tackling CGBRs. Uh, uh, that's my outline of presentation. Uh, however, uh, major things have been mentioned, so I have to run through because we have already had uh, the background and the uh, and uh, and uh, the rest about uh, CG, uh, uh, GCBRs. Uh, notably, we know that these uh, events, uh, which are caused by biological agents, which could do negatively and permanently alter our trajectory of humanity, or even potential for human uh, extinction. And uh, if unchecked, uh, this could do likely be of high consequence uh, for our existence on this globe. It can destabilize governments, uh, international relationships, economies, societal stability, and even global security. Uh, Peter had already alluded to the uh, scenarios of these GCBRs. Uh, largely, I will be uh, concentrating on the deliberate because we have handled more of the natural pandemics. However, uh, this graph indicates the probability of each occurring that largely we've been uh, experiencing natural pandemics, and that's the invited pyramid. There have been accidental releases, as we shall see examples. And deliberate attacks, documented and undocumented. 
However, we see in this graph that the likelihood of deliberate attacks to occur is kind of limited. However, when it occurs, it, has, it is of a great impact. Humanity. So uh, these biological materials that could be used in deliberate attacks are likely to be engineered pathogens. Since we have uh, science tells us that in natural outbreaks of disease and epidemics, they are self-limiting that over time they are likely to win and we see either uh, uh, complete uh, silence over these uh, uh, emergencies or sometimes happens uh, periodically or sporadically as even uh, Peter had alluded, especially with anthrax. But these are also uh, supported by other factors that to do with the pathogen biology and the rest. We have had uh, laboratory accidents documented. Uh, an example, of uh, influenza epidemic, that's the Russian flu. The previous uh, presenter talked about it, which infected, uh, which uh, mostly uh, people aged 25 and below. We have had sequenced H1N1 in the 1950s, and also smallpox that was found in storage in 2014, which is known to have been um, uh, wiped out. So, deliberate attacks can result from GOU's research. Uh, one of the participants uh, was asking, or was uh, ha having concerns with GEO research. And there are examples of Uh, scientific uh, studies that have occurred and where some organisms have been diverted for nefarious use. One of the areas of research was in, uh, in the enhancing of harmful consequences of biological agent or toxin and one of the published examples was the creation of the pathogenic simian immunodeficiency virus. There has been a disruption in immunity or effectiveness of an immunization without clinical and or agricultural justification, such as the modification of the mousepox virus, rendering the vac vaccination ineffective, and many other examples as you may uh, later on access uh, this slide and read through. There has been an example of a deliberate release. This is a CBRN release by Omo Shiniruko, a doomsday cult, um, who, which was led by Shoko uh, Asahara, who also tested nerve agents in Western Australia. But notably, in 1995, he wanted to put down a government Japanese government had to use saline, a nerve agent, uh, packaged and he put it in the subway, and uh, all people were disembarking and uh, embarking on, the, uh, on, the, on those shuttles, on the trains, were affected, and 90, 980 people were injured and 13 dead. You would imagine uh, that if such a thing occurred with biologics as an example of the COVID, you can see how it has spread. Each person boarding or disembarking is a potential contaminant for the rest. And if unchecked, you will find yourselves overwhelmed by such an unknown enemy, the invisible enemy. And that's part of the CBRN example. So, as uh, 
part, as participant frontliners scientists what uh, how do we mitigate these biological risks uh, we have categories of um, entities that can propagate this and those are the states and the non-state actors so who shapes the mitigation or the intent of use of this uh, biological material and that's the state and what else would the state do it also goes ahead to constrain capabilities of a non-state actor prevent access of these materials monitor personal reliability personal security information trafficking or transport of these some of these materials and having also physical security of some of the facilities that are handling these uh, biological materials in shaping uh, the intent we need to also prevent misperceptions uh, and arms racing because some of the, uh, these materials may not be harmful per se, but if devices are designed to propagate this, then uh, delivery becomes easier. Otherwise, these organisms are with us, we stay them, we are in a zone, we are in the epicenter of these organisms, we do this for positive, uh, useful research, but with a negative intent, it is possible that they can be bioweaponized. The only challenge is on delivery. So once uh, a non-state actor accesses a device that can easily disperse these materials, then he's good to go. He or she is good to go. So we need to shape some of these developments through transparency and also be able to locate identify cordon off and even make some arrests and link uh, these public events to law enforcement in a way to deter other uh, negative agents from accessing them then with these facilities also need have some accountabilities so that there are no diversions so our interventions are geared at reducing risk of accidents with these engineered pathogens if any by strengthening biosafety and also avoid this element of excessive risk research trying to dig out the unknown, you end up creating some weapon that might not be able to be controlled. So we need also to intervene at the level of preventing malicious actors by exploiting uh, these materials and also misuse by controlling access to materials and services, preventing uh, information uh, of hazard publications. Those are almost embedded into the eight pillars of biosecurity. So, who are the key stakeholders in uh, managing GC, uh, GCBRs? I looked at this and uh, during my analysis I saw that I could only categorize them uh, in these four categories. However, uh, it is not cast in stone, it is open for inclusion, even for others that I might have left out. Uh, because with experience of managing some of these uh, conditions and pandemics, we realize that these were uh, key, key uh, category of, 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 of stakeholders that we run to, public health and medical, safety and security, governance and policy, and when uh, we request for assistance, humanitarian aid comes in. Uh, this uh, graphics is 
because uh, this graphic is uh, for all events, and these are some of the mapped uh, 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 stakeholders that come in in uh, any event, and they are in four quadrants. On the left quadrant, we have public health and medical, and those are the likely uh, key stakeholders uh, that are, uh, are to come in. Or the lower left quadrant is the safety and security. Uh, you look at the uh, UNDSS, regional and law enforcement, Interpol, national and regional militaries, and name it. Then on the governance and policy, we have also those entities, uh, World Customs Organization. There are just many. On the upper quadrant on the right, we have the new Imperial World Food Program, UNICEF, and there is, this is for all events. But this one changes as um, uh, as changes as events also change over time. It is just uh, it's not uh, literally universal. Under the public health and medical for uh, Ugandan case, we have the Uganda public health sector the veterinary sector, we have the labs, the pharmacies and, and pharmaceutical companies. Then we have agencies that always come in to help the World Health Organization, uh, World Health of Animal Health, uh, Gavi and CEPI. Uh, these are the key stakeholders that I highlighted that uh, always participate in some of these pandemic outbreaks. Uh, security and uh, safety and security. We have the reinforcement, military, Interpol, uh, the United Nations uh, Department of Security and Safety, Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, and the UN Secretary General's mechanisms. Uh, under government governance and policy, we have MDAs, intergovernmental agencies, the UN agencies. National Academies and Biological Weapons uh, Convention, <coughs> the support unit. Under the humanitarian aid, we have UN agencies, some other member states who might come in to give a helping hand, the local and international NGOs and other countries that may not be affected. And these are the key uh, 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 humanitarian aid agencies that always come in to respond. And this, we are not going to reinvent any other in the GCBRs. So uh, the stakeholders role, those stakeholders, the categories that I've mentioned, we have these. 10 uh, key roles, and uh, as I earlier said, uh, I was content on the DBEs, the deliberate biological event. In case of any of these, what are the roles of these key stakeholders? Notably is case identification, agent identification, humanitarian response, uh, they come in in suspicion of deliberate use to investigate. They even request state request for assistance in, you know, when you're overwhelmed. Uh, they are investigative response for purposes of uh, attribution and retribution. Then there is a declaration of public health emergence. There is also response and recovery and remediation. We also confirmation of deliberate use and all other attributes that go with it and the ongoing response and recovery. These are the key roles that these uh, stakeholders participate in. Uh, the next graph uh, for each of these, uh, I, had, I have three uh, graphics on it. I will not go through it. Since it is already uploaded, you will download, and because if I go through it, it will take a lot of time. Because this one just basically now talks about uh, case identification as one of the first stage, 
and goes out of that sigmoid, all these activities, the roles are indicated on that sigmoid. But notable here is that at the peak, that's where we have investigative response and WHO uh, public health emergence is declared along that pathway, then followed by response and recovery, confirmation of the deliberate use of these uh, bioorganisms, and then is followed by remediation and recovery. So uh, for each uh, of those roles, we see who responds, uh, who is responsible for each other. We have affected the member state, the NGOs, if any, any, any identification of cases. Then we see under the private sector, we have also private sector health care providers, which who sometimes come in voluntarily to help. And in each current selected event, we have all uh, these key um, stakeholders that come in under different categories that the area eroded. But at case identification, you would literally uh, uh, would not uh, have the humanitarian coming in. They first leave it to the country to see how they are managing until they are overwhelmed, then they start calling for assistance. So uh, this is the next for agent uh, identified, but I want to go through all those graphics for each because I've already mentioned the key stakeholders uh, under those key categories. So I would just go straight to um, the conclusion that the policy landscape across a deliberate biological event timeline highlights that uh, there is no single or unified policy that applies throughout a deliberate biological event, nor in a single stakeholder with a clear coordinating uh, role throughout the entire event. But we have these policies and uh, and uh, the policies available, they to clarify the stakeholder roles at each uh, specific point in time. And we have the documents that signify SOPs and what, and identify the mandates across the entire event timeline. So these gaps sometimes uh, of a lack of a coordinated policy and mandate across stakeholders has seen some entities also even having infights in response, and it's particularly acute and likely to be problematic during event identification, investigation response, and also preserving some of these hot zones for criminal investigations. I thank you. Thank you very much, Lieutenant Kano, Dr. Godwin. So, questions, comments? Well, I think this session. Uh, thank you so much, uh, the presenter, for that particular session. I think uh, you bring up very important uh, points there. Uh, I would like to shine a light on one of the categories of the stakeholders who are sometimes um, left out, and that is uh, the communities. Um, with advancement in technology, we can see that there is a lot that is happening in the different communities. We have the sprouting out of what we call uh, do-it-yourself kind of labs, so people in the communities are coming up with uh, laboratories, they are doing work in their kitchens, they are trying out very different things using the available technologies, and sometimes if not paid to attention, we may not really know what could come out of the different uh, projects that these particular communities are carrying out. So I think uh, in the different uh, discussions, in the different fora, as we engage the different stakeholders, it is very key that we include uh, communities as very key uh, stakeholders in this, because there is so much 
that is going on and anything could go wrong when it comes to uh, the works that they are doing. So that is uh, one of the group that I think would be uh, a good addition to what uh, you just spoke about. Thank you so much. Any comments to her, maybe before we proceed to the next? Uh, she, it was a contribution and a compliment to, right. uh, to what I had presented, and that's why I said it is open for inclusion in the case I skipped. That's what I had earlier stated. Thank you, Chair of Symbio Africa. Thank you very much for this wonderful talk. It was a really good talk for us, and it fits uh, very well into what we are trying to do. I would also like to add on to what she, she mentioned. I think we should also, you should also think about civil society as, as the stakeholders, and also the educators as universities and the, uh, technical colleges should also be included. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. I think uh, along the way, I also mentioned academia and the rest in some of these different uh, categories because they expound. I could not list all. I just uh, put, put them together under the different pillars. And, and somewhere in the middle of the, my presentation, I even mentioned private health care providers. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, LT Cullen. Uh, oh, your topic is so relevant, this training. Mm -hmm. uh, in case you didn't get my name before, it's John. Uh, I want to emphasize on the implementation of your recommendation yes. of strengthening uh, vice safety. Yes. And yes. much of your presentation is of, about uh, biosecurity. And yes. I'm thinking of uh, protecting these uh, biological agents mm. for catastrophic risks uh, that are leading to causation of pandemic in a way that our system is protecting even the money in the bank. And when we are talking of these uh, stakeholders, I'm looking for a way, how do we put it, whereby uh, a, a practicing scientist in the lab that is carrying our research will be scrutinized by having a body that will approve those uh, excessive research, the studies we were concerned about in a way that all these stakeholders come to a table at the benchmark and have the research approved and have to monitor even how research is being carried out and how the, the biological agents are being protected inside the lab that the public will not have exposure into. Uh, yeah, that's where I look where the conflict is. Like we don't come together and agree that from different background, from multi-sectoral approach, we should come together and take ourselves as people sole responsible for protecting, you know, the public from uh, from acquiring those uh, pandemic that are deliberately released or accidentally released. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your uh, for that uh, observation. Um, I think uh, along the way again, I talked about. Uh, much as I never mentioned them, but I talked about uh, the key eight pillars of biosecurity. And uh, known to us is that in these facilities, uh, there are controls for materials that are, uh, are in these facilities. There is information security as a key pillar under biosecurity. There is also um, uh, personnel reliability and security. Because each day you need to know these, uh, these uh, individuals that are dif handling different uh, organisms or isolates or whatever, biomaterials. Because if you don't do so, uh, people have, we, for example, if you have a facility, how many of these uh, facilities that are handling these uh, high consequence materials. And uh, the key uh, administrators of these facilities, do they know where, for example, Bagash comes from? Do, you, do they know where I stay? Do they know my lifestyle? 
do they know the people I interact with? So some of these things may be uh, underlooked, but they are key. If I have a problem with my people at my home, I can transfer my anger to think that probably because my wife comes from a different clan, therefore that clan is also a problem to me. So what I will think about is wiping it out. So it would be even prudent that in these key facilities, there is somebody pressed there to look at personal security and personal reliability. Look at the baby. You come and ask, hey, uh, did you sleep well? Uh, how is it? How are children home? Everything. Over time, uh, you know, that's why now the social science leave us. We tend to concentrate more on core science and leave the other component to come and help in us. Because these ones would quickly say, but do you know uh, the head of that uh, component seems to be having a domestic issue. So you give this person leave or you come to understand this person because this is how some of these things are engineered. The person just goes into self pity, depression, but continues to work and is a, not uh, uh, attended to. And we end up with some of these things. So thanks so much. We need to strengthen biosecurity, and this is not a one man show. So we need to strengthen the One Health strategy, an all inclusive, uh, an all disciplinary, and all sectors to look into uh, this GCBRN. Any other? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bagash. Me, I just wanted you to share with us some experience. Uh, you've talked about the multi-sectoral approach. You have different players, the stakeholders. What are the challenges, uh, for example, of implementing that during an auto break? Are there any challenges that probably you've faced while dealing with these multiple stakeholders or people? Um, without going to the nitty gritties of the challenges, I think this is some of the key, key area that we are trying to come from. We've been encapsulated in a siloed way of handling our day-to-day -day activities. Even if I see something but which is under my docket, but I cannot even handle, I may not pass it on a person that can handle. So we have a challenge of siloed way of handling some of the key issues. And that has been the key issue in managing these outbreaks. Because uh, if we are responding to an anthrax outbreak, for example, a person would expect me to come with probably a convoy of vehicles from defense, then a person from ministry will sit in one, in one 14 seater uh, uh, bus alone, just because it is for Ministry of Health, it does not allow any other passengers. Then for the Maif, probably will even come late, he will come riding on a motorbike because the double cabin uh, collapsed either on the way or the other day. So we find our areas operating in a disjointed manner. Another issue is that there is always competition. Who has seen this first and who is advertising this first? I will give an example. There was an outbreak. Um, I'm forgetting that, but it's not so far. From, I'm forgetting the year. In, uh, there was three outbreaks of anthrax. One was in Queen, in eastern Uganda. Another one was in Chiruhura, in, uh, in western. And another one, another outbreak of anthrax was in, uh, in the northwest part of the country. That is Arua. So uh, we moved with the teams from the One Health uh, uh, platform, went to Queen. When we left Queen uh, in the east, we moved on to, to West Nile. 
when we reached West Nile, we thought we are moving as a team. When we reached there, we found people from FAO we are coming out from investigating the UVR, Uganda Virus Research Institute was also coming in with its own people. Then we are also coming in with the Defense Maif and the Minister of Health, all responding to one event. So what's wrong with communication? What's wrong with collaboration? What's wrong with uh, uh, Then at the end of the day, what happens is people make publications, you guess? then you start complaining. But I participated in this area. Why is it that I'm not appearing among the, the, the people who investigated this case? So that's, that, that disjointness, I think one Harris is going to, ad, uh, should address it. That is our anticipation. Then we come out of that siloed way of working because it is now beyond our disciplines, background disciplines, it is all of us synergizing efforts to managing these events. Otherwise, working in a thyroid way is not going to be helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll take one more question, and then after which, shall we go for a group photo, go for our break, and return for the next session. So I'll take his question, go out for a group photo at the front of the hotel, and then we proceed for, for break tea. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. It was a very good uh, presentation. Um, and I believe uh, we should add the community. We usually forget about the community. Uh, local government as well, you know, things are usually organized at the central level, but involving the local government, making them more responsive to mm -hmm. these events at the local level is very important as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the private sector should not be left out. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, and also we have to manage conflicts, because I believe uh, those conflicts sometimes are very small at the beginning and they tend to uh, grow very, and you have uh, big consequences. But w one thing that surprised me all the time, we have anthrax in this part of the world, you know, DRC, Uganda, and we bury those animals in our communities. And I think uh, they still, those areas where we bury them, are uh, still potentially sources where you can get some uh, uh, pathogen. And nobody guards them. I don't believe there's the security around those sites, but we care more about what is in the lab and nobody pays attention to those sites where we bury those animals, which potentially still have pathogens there. Someone with bad intention can go and then just call pick, pick something. And nobody pays attention to that. There is no bio biosecurity for those sites. And we bury them every day, everywhere in the communities. So I think that's something we should be thinking about. And anthrax, we know, is not a, a game. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Godwin's Makash. You're welcome. So I think that will be the end of, of, of this session. I'm going to quickly guide you on what's happening after here. You have a question online? Yes. I'll give the person. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, I want to thank Dr. Bagash uh, for this uh, elaborate presentation and highlighting the role of stakeholders. And I think as Uganda and also the region, we need now to come up with a comprehensive mapping, uh, which we can actually also look at influence and then the responsibility across all different uh, players which can uh, further inform our policy uh, formulation directions and also the mitigation measures. So I think this is something we can take on from here that we need a comprehensive uh, mapping kind of uh, a plan and strategy that can feed into our government processes. Uh, not forgetting uh, important players like um, civil society and the common people, the Wanainchi, how, how can they uh, really uh, be part of this and we move together with them. But also uh, not, not forgetting the, the farmer level preference uh, when it comes to actual issues of like uh, farm biosecurity and all, uh, all the like. But I want to thank Dr. Bagash. That, that was just an additional that I thought I should uh, put it to consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Musa. 
That was Mr. Musa Kohangana, yeah, yeah. the safety officer with the regulators of the site. Yes, so as I mentioned earlier, we're going to go out for a group photo outside, after which we shall have our break tea for 30 minutes. Since we've had an extensive discussion with all of stakeholders in this question and answer, we are going to leave out the panel discussion on the same. So when you, when you come back from break tea, shall be having a presentation, a facilitation by Dr. Steven on the technologies required to address GCBRs. And then we could proceed with the program that way. Is that fine with us? So that's how we are going to move. So let's step out into the, to the front of the, of the hotel, the entrance, have the group photo, then come back in for our break tea. Then after, after that, we shall move on to the session at 11.30, technologies required to address GCBRs. Thank you very much to our morning facilitators and to all of you for making it here. And I really hope you are enjoying it as much as I am. I'm learning a lot from all these great minds. And hopefully by the end of the workshop, the three days, you'll have a better understanding of how to address GCBRs. So group photo. The ones online, we can also order for something to eat or drink. <laughs> Have a short break. When you return, we shall engage you further. In case you have any questions, comments, you, you shall use the same mode as we have been doing now. Thank you. device means to have better mitigation strategies as we handle the different aspects in our symbiotic biology, symbiotic processes. Since we need, from your presentation, we need and we must move in that direction. We need the different uh, bacteria, we need the vaccines, we need the drugs because the population needs them. And what we need now to think about is how we, how we can coexist by developing better mitigation strategies. And one of them is the policy. But if you have a non-functional policy, it is as good as nothing. If you have a very good policy with no legal framework, you still can't uh, explore beyond the, the 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 landscape so i want to suggest that uh, as we move forward it is important that we have platforms to think of the mitigations we can we can explore whether we need to develop them now or we need to think about them as we coexist in our different areas of service. I submit. Thank you. Thank you very much for that wonderful insight. I think that brings us to our uh, next. We have, we have four goals, and this workshop is covered the first two. So what we talk about, I think we'll cover the third and the fourth goal. We, we need to work on them now, not to exactly yeah, the features now. So thank you very much. Yeah, um, I'm trying to put together the previous, uh, your presentation and previous presentations. Uh, so the, the challenge I'm having and the question I have is what is the vision? Do we have at this stage a vision or a common, are we going to develop a common vision 
at some point. Because I look at uh, all what is being said here is very open and it's very vast in terms of uh, what we can do. And we cannot do everything. And we, can, we have to start somewhere. And identifying that somewhere where we have to start is very important so that we can have a scope that is very focused and then we can grow over time. Because I see we have several angles, several directions we can take, but it's very important to uh, start having that common vision to, uh, to have, so that we can start really developing something concrete. Because I fear that at the end of the day, we may just remain at that high level and it will be very difficult to develop something that will be really that will help us move forward in a more effective way. So I will, I'm wondering about what is the vision, if that with some ideas about that vision at this point. Even just in terms of uh, how do we adapt these technologies, and we have uh, comparative advantage. Those technologies are developed by countries that are well advanced. What is our niche? How are we going to? What will be our role? What will be? What can we do? Some are already ready to be adapted, to be utilized. And what is our strategy? How are we going to develop? So there are a lot of questions around uh, that vision, where we want to go. And it's very important to define it clearly early on in the process. Thank you. Well, well let me answer. Thank you very much. Uh, that was really very important. That's why we have this workshop. That's why we, 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 we call you people here, so that we can have this dialogue. But by the end of the day, that's why we are here. And this is the first one we are going to, go to, we're going to do for the whole of Africa. So at, we are going to, at the end of the day, we are going to start something. And you have to be part of it. Okay, thank you. Any other question or comment online or here? Right. If we have no other question or comment, I would like to thank Dr. Stephen for that wonderful facilitation. And then thereafter, proceed to the next session on the agenda. Thank you. So the next session, much as we shall enjoy the knowledge within the session, we don't have a chance to directly ask the questions, but we can still have those questions coming after this session so that we shall be able to get the responses from the facilitator by email and be able to send you those responses at a more convenient time. So I'm going to, to play a video here.
good to take a step back and look at some of the reasons. So I'm going to briefly introduce the, the gentleman that you'll be listening to in this particular session, mm -hmm. Dr. Piers Millet. So Dr. Piers Millet is a vice president at the IGM Foundation. IGM is the International Genetic Engineering Machine. And previous experience, he is, is a principal at uh, Biosecure Limited, a company that deals in safeguarding the bioeconomy. He's a senior research fellow with the Future of Humanity Institute, who are also key in doing work on global catastrophic risks. He's, form, he's also a global fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. He's a consultant on the research and development blueprint with the World Health Organization supporting public health research and development, focusing on medical countermeasures for prioritized diseases. Previously served as a deputy head of the Biological Weapons Convention from July 2007 to 2014 for a period of seven years. And has also previously worked with the United Nations as a political affairs officer with the Office of the Disarmament Affairs. So he holds a uh, a Bachelor of Science degree in Microbiology from the University of Leeds, after which he went on to do a Master of Arts International Relations and National Security Studies at the University of Bradford, and did another Master of Science in International Relations and Affairs at the same university. He has a Doctor of Philosophy in International Relations and Affairs, still from the University of Bradford. So for this particular session, he'll be giving us a look into uh, new and emerging technologies addressing long and short-term challenges and threats, given his experience and work with the uh, AGM Foundation. So let's listen in and uh, shall, shall capture your feedback at the end of the session so that we can have some of those comments responded to at a more convenient time. Thank you. Risk. Before I do that, I'm going to introduce myself. I run the, I run the responsibility program at iGEM, the world's largest synthetic biology competition. We work to make sure our teams are working safely, securely, and responsibly, and producing projects that will have a good for the world. I'm also a senior research fellow at the Future of Humanity Institute at the University of Oxford and co-founder and principal of Biosecure Limited, a UK-based consultancy dedicated to safeguarding the virus. Over the years, I've consulted for many different intergovernmental organisations, uh, for example, looking at the implications and governance of emerging biotechnologies. And for over 10 years, I worked within the United Nations system for the Biological Weapons Convention ultimately as the acting head of its implementation support unit. It may seem a bit strange trying to explain why we need to worry about global catastrophic risks whilst we're entering the third year of a pandemic. But I think it's important to take a step back and look at some of the reasons what we mean about risk, why we might need to worry about catastrophic risks and why biological catastrophic risks are also worthy of attention. I'm going to start by talking to you about risk. Risk is a function of likelihood and consequence. Certainly there are those people that have looked at how likely and what the consequence of a biological weapons use might be. You can see here, for example, estimates from the International Committee from the Red Cross about how real is the threat of a biological weapon today, and equally uh, some research done by the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace on the countering the coming bioweapons threat. We can also expand what we mean by likelihood. We can look at both the threat and the vulnerability. There are certainly some folks that believe that the threat of biological warfare is increasing. Equally, we can see other bodies, international bodies including, highlighting the fact that we're vulnerable to biological threats, whether they be accidental, natural or deliberate. 
The consequences of the use of a biological weapon could also be quite extreme. Some people, and here you can see a high profile person, believes that the use of biological weapons could actually end up killing more people than nuclear war. Before we go any, further, we go any further, I think it would be useful to pause so that you can think about the risk and what you think about this. How likely do you think a, a biological risk is? Just what consequences can you imagine? Can you imagine something that would be as catastrophic as a global catastrophic biological risk? Ideas Got some ideas head. in your head? Okay, well, I'll continue. I want to come back to that risk equation. I want to start putting numbers in to show you a couple of things about this. So in this example, you can see that we've put the consequence at a fixed value. All I'm expecting you to see here is that as the likelihood increases all the way up to one, which is something to denote certain, you can see the risk increasing proportionately. Now I should remind you, these numbers are completely made up. I'm only using them to illustrate that if we have a series of events that are just as likely to happen, that the, the changes in the consequences of those events also affect the risk. In other words, both the likelihood and the consequence are equally important in defining the risk. One of the advantages starting to look at numbers is that we can also start at look at the probability of events happening. This is a classic bell curve and most of the time we're focusing on the most likely events. Most of the things we're thinking about are in this blue circle. They, they represent the largest proportion of events. However, in any distribution, including the risk from biology, we see these tail ends, the, the red circles on this diagram. These might be very unlikely to happen, uh, but they exist both on the small and on the large end of potential consequences. Once we know that unlikely things do happen, it's important that we can actually go out there and start estimating likelihoods of really unlikely events. Here you can see some, some risks of, of dying in, in different extreme ways. These have come from, from, a, from information provided by uh, the insurance industry and, and by The Economist. What we can see here is that it's unlikely but plausible that you might die of anything in the next 12 months. But you can see that, that the more exotic types of death become increasingly unlikely. The most unlikely death that I could find any numbers for uh, is death by asteroid. There is a chance of a 1 times 10 to the minus 8 chance of an individual dying by death by asteroid. That's important. We're going to come back to that number in a little bit. Other people have tried to put numbers on the most high consequence events that we've ever seen in the history of humanity. You can, you can see worst case death tolls for a variety of different events on this slide. Uh, you can see that, for example, um, the Great Smog of London in 1952 is believed to have killed about 12,000 people. Equally, you can see moving up the list, uh, there was a flood in, in China in 1931 that killed about 4 million people. The largest consequence, the most uh, traumatic event that I was able to find numbers for, uh, was an estimate for, for the Black Death, a disease event uh, that happened in the 14th century, uh, which is estimated to have killed somewhere in the region of 200 million people. So what happens if we put some of these estimated values back into that risk equation that we looked at earlier? Here you can see that most unlikely event, death by asteroids. If, if the event we're talking about was as rare as you dying from an asteroid, there'd be an overall risk, one person being the consequence on here, of 1 times 10 to the minus 8 uh, risk of that death. Uh, if we move up, just as unlikely, if it's just as unlikely as dying by asteroid, but the consequence goes up to 36 times 10 to the 6th, which was uh, the number of estimated deaths from the First World War, you can see the risk of that event then goes up to uh, 0 0.49 relatively on this arbitrary scale. Again, moving down one further line, if we have the most unlikely event to happen, 1 times 10 to the minus 8, and then we're looking at the most consequential, the biggest death toll that we were able to find, that 200 million, uh, you can see that we end up with an overall risk of, of two. But what happens if everybody died, if we had the worst consequence, if we had everybody on the planet 
dying because of an event. Here you see that unlikely asteroid strike multiplied by the number of people on the planet, and it gives you a relative risk of 70. I'm really doing this not to try and put numbers on it, but to just show you that when we're talking about events that have very, very large consequences, when we're talking about catastrophic risk, the overall risk can still be considerably high. And do we know how likely it is that we would have a global catastrophic biological risk event happen? Well, myself and some colleagues did take an attempt to, to look at how frequently incidents happen. We see that a small incident happens roughly about 100 times a century. We see um, a medium sized event happening roughly, if you look back over history, about 10 times a century. And we seem to see a, a pandemic about once every 100 years. When we look at existential risk, we use three different models to get at that. And, and you can see from this slide that the, the range of, of numbers that we came up with differed by about, uh, about four to five orders of magnitude. So that's well within the sort of difference of the risks that we were looking at on the previous slide. We know it's very, very difficult to put precise numbers on the likelihood of having a major biological event. But we do know certain facts that increase the likelihood of that happening. For example, there's a very well documented history of many powerful states, many countries having offensive biological warfare programs. Countries have invested huge amounts of time and effort into creating biological weapons that are intended to cause major consequences, that are intended to, to have a, a catastrophic or a large impact event. We also know that there's research happening that increases the risk of an accident happening that could lead to a catastrophic biological event. Uh, we are actively pursuing research in different parts of the world around potentially pandemic pathogens. We are trying intentionally to create uh, pathogens that are highly virulent, that are transmissible, and for which we have no public health interventions. The very existence of those sorts of agents increase the likelihood that one day one will escape, that one day we will have a lab instigated pandemic, and that in turn could lead to a, a global catastrophic biological risk. We also know that it's not just the conduct of those research. It's not just the physical viruses themselves sitting in, in freezers that influence the likelihood of an event. Increasingly, we are generating new information. We are creating ways of, of, of sharing and replicating science and engineering and pursuing avenues of research that were previously not thought of or not possible. These generate what we've been calling information hazards. The very fact that this knowledge is out there increases the chance that somebody might pursue it, might end up with an agent that could cause a biological risk. Equally, it, the number of, of people with the knowledge, with the skills, with the ability to deliver highly dangerous biological agents is increasing as we, we make biology more an information-based as opposed to a, an artifact-based science. We also know that some of these risks uh, might not be accidental. It could be that somebody deliberately goes out of their way to create a, a biological agent or a biological weapon that's intended to cause a catastrophic risk. You see these arm spirals in history. Here, for example, if you start in the bottom left-hand corner, the, the UK uh, at the end of the 19th century was exploring ways to create disease events by destroying or blowing up or bombing uh, public health infrastructure, for example, sewage treatment plants. Um, the, the knowledge that the British were looking at that uh, in the earlier century led in the First World War uh, Germany to, to have an exhaustive international uh, offensive biological weapons program intended to target animals, uh, and they carried out attacks on, on a number of continents. The knowledge that Germany had done that through the First World War led the UK in the Second World War to develop biological weapons. In this case, linseed meal uh, anthrax lace cattle cakes. They were intended to spread over the hinterlands of, of Germany and kill cattle on a widespread um, basis. The fact that Germany and the UK had looked into these weapons led uh, to a, a large-scale Japanese offensive weapons program that included bombs 
uh, and that were actually used in parts of China uh, during the during the Second World War. The existence of those programs in turn during the Cold War led to, to an escalation. You can see here uh, wide area dispersal trials um, in, in the case being tested on ships in the middle of the ocean uh, and that in turn escalated up to uh, large scale area dispersal trials off the back of aircraft uh, where the biological agents were laid down in lines and clouds that were literally miles long. And that in turn escalated to the Soviet program during the, the Cold War, which you can see here the fermenter hall in one of their production facilities, literally thousands and thousands of, of litres of, of fermentation capacity designed specifically to make biological weapons. So where will this lead? It's possible at the top of this spiral, we see some sort of uh, mutual assured destruction via biological weapons, the sort of thing that we saw during the Cold War with nuclear weapons, where the intent was deliberately to build weapons intended to destroy the world, and then to have them on hair triggers uh, in case the enemy attacks, that this will go off automatically. Uh, that, that in turn increases the likelihood that these weapons might actually be used if they existed. And this is certainly one way that we could get to a plausible case for a global catastrophic biological risk. We also know that the procedures, practices and mechanisms that we have in place to deal with these risks, to deal with the risks of biological warfare and that sort of arm spiral are far from perfect. We know that those norms, for example, the Biological Weapons Convention, have never been tested. Since that treaty has existed, we have not had militarily desirable biological weapons. Uh, nobody has actually really, really wanted those sorts of weapons. The military hated them. Uh, there was no rationale for pursuing them. But those developments in science and technology, perhaps may make it feasible, may make it desirable. Uh, and we don't know what would happen to a treaty like the Biological Weapons Convention if we could see uh, biological weapons that the military wanted or that national strategic thinkers uh, believed was in their interest to pursue. Equally, part of the rationale for the ban was around these not providing weapons of mass destruction to an increasing number of states. It's not by accident that the states that, that suggested we should ban biological weapons already had nuclear weapons. Um, and equally, we're seeing a period of degradations of norms. If we look at chemical weapons, we can see uh, small scale use of chemical weapons on a, on a limited basis for assassination purposes or for unspecified uses in, in countries. Um, slowly chipping away at this global ban, the idea that these weapons should never be used, they become more acceptable. We stop listening, we stop looking at the headlines of small scale use of chemical weapons. And it would be very, very scary if that was to also happen to biological weapons. So my penultimate thought for you today is, all of these things may be impacting the, the likelihood of a global catastrophic biological risk, but could we really get there? Could we really make these sorts of weapons? Are we that stupid to actually weaponize biology? What do you think? If we look back over history, we can see that over time we develop new technologies. You can see waves of different innovation happening over the course of history. And when you start mapping advances in weapons over the top of those waves of innovation, you can see that as we develop new capabilities, new skills, new tools, that we very, very quickly, almost universally, take them and turn them into weapons for war. You can see on here, for example, that the advent of chemical engineering very quickly leads to the advent of chemical weapons. You can see the application of information technology leading to cyber warfare. The very fact that we are now developing these radical new capabilities in biotechnology leads me to question, at least, What's so unique about biotechnology that we wouldn't turn it into a weapon? And with that thought, I'm returning to the idea of the bell curve. I think it's entirely natural, it's entirely appropriate that we spend almost all of our time, effort and resources worrying about the most likely events. We should really be thinking about how to strengthen our infrastructure against natural diseases. We should be really thinking about how to minimise the risk of biotechnology being used to cause harm in whatever form. However, on the basis of what I've said to you today, 
I do believe that we should be spending a small amount of our time, a small amount of our resources, focusing on those tail risks, focusing on the li least likely events, especially because the consequences could be so great that the overall risk is just as scary, just as something worthy of our investment as the more likely events that we're traditionally using to deal with, used to dealing with. Thank you for listening to what I have to say. I hope you found it interesting. I wish you well with the remainder of your meeting. And I'd like to just conclude by thanking the organizers for the opportunity to talk to you today, as well as our sponsors for enabling our program and our works to continue. Thank you very much. See you soon. Thank you very much, Dr. Payas Millet. I think his, his discussion has given us a lot of food for thought. So before we move on to the next session, still by Dr. Steven, I'd like us to take a moment to comment on what he just discussed, especially I think you've seen that previously, once humans learn to do something new, Next thing that follows is to use it for bad. I'm going to hearing chemical weapons. IT, you know, have cyber warfare. Now that we're having synthetic biology and biotechnology, us who are here, how can we ensure that uh, we do not follow the same trend? So I will pass the microphone around. Our repertoire will be capturing our comments. And in case you have any questions, you can still ask them. We have that discussion briefly for about 10 minutes as uh, Dr. Steven prepares to take us on to the next, to the next session. So anyone with a comment or question, you can raise your hand and I'll bring the microphone over to you. Uh, uh, thank you. Concerning these uh, risks of uh, these events, the likelihood and the consequence and all those that uh, entails the vulnerabilities and threats. Uh, to me, this takes me to the area of preparedness because uh, we need to, to, uh, to make it steer clear that we have to move with what is happening because uh, when you look at the trend of events, there is international breach of some of these treaties that have been put forward to act as international police, International Atomic Energy Council, Biological Weapons and Toxins Convention, Chemical Weapons, uh convention these these are treaties and uh that have protocols that have been set out to restrain uh states uh, or countries in the proliferation stockpiling and re, uh, re, re some of these uh weapons but what we are seeing globally now is that there is a breach even for those that have ratified. So, we, when uh, yesterday I was watching CNN, where North Korea eh, is poisoning, it has tested, but is poisoning again to follow it with a nuclear test. But there are international regimes, International Atomic Energy Council, and so the major powers are actually uh, 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 the first to breach some of the international regimes. So what is next is that we should also continue to prepare for some of these things. Yes, we fear to touch the unknown. We fear to touch into the technologies because we are likely to trigger something that we may not handle. But uh, other people are also not sleeping. They are bringing back organisms that we have since known to have been extinct. As already they are still stockpiled, they are not destroyed, they are not diverting. So it is, it is, it is a real uh, threat, and uh, the likelihood of this happening is 
imminent and the consequences are dire. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kano. So the observation is that despite all these international efforts, still even the ones mostly charged with the responsibility of ensuring we follow end up being some of the people breaching the very same regimes they put in place. So what can we do about it? Any other question? Any other comment? Yes. Me have half first, and I come back to you. Uh, thank you. The the comment that uh, I would like to put across is um, on the issue of the of the technologies. I think uh, one of the things that we still struggle with, even up to today is when it comes to uh, regulation of some of these technologies. And um, it has taken us so long, um, especially on the African continent, to come up with uh, you know, legal frameworks to regulate some of these. We've heard about stories of how different countries are trying to come up with some regulation like for biotechnology and all that. But there has always been this pull and push. Uh, there are those countries that could have moved, but there are those that are still lagging behind. And yet, the exposure of the people within this um, confine is, could get ahead as compared to the pace at which we are establishing some of these uh, regulations. So um, from my end, I think as responsible uh, stakeholders, we, we ought to see how to put in place uh, frameworks that can allow people to do, to, to utilize the technologies within the confines of, you know, some bit of regulation. But when we, we, we think we, we are maybe so skeptical about something and we keep pulling ropes, and at the end of it all, we don't have any defined, um, any defined solution on how people should implement some of these technologies. There are people who could actually take that as a gap and end up using it for the wrong, for the wrong thing. So I think uh, that is one of the things as stakeholders, whatever we are going back, uh, to our countries and whatever effort that we have to contribute to this, to see that uh, people can be able to do their work, but properly regulated, it, it would go a very long way. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's unfortunate that the presenter is not here to take question. But in the view of our own situations, uh, we are being fought by so many mechanisms, like strategies were already made, whereby instead of us, for example, the, the weapons we even get from the West and other continents into Africa are being used only you know, for, for civil wars. Mm -hmm. And we will not have resources to study even the quality of, of the of the weaponry machine that we use are they are they giving effects or 